These are trying times. So I have a lovely little fact for you. Look at these trees. Why isn't there any snow at the base of these trees? Well, that is because trees don't just absorb sunlight for photosynthesis, they also absorb the heat of sunlight. And because of that, these trees kind of act like radiators. They hold on to the heat and they radiate it out after you know the sun goes down. So the snow around and the ground around these trees tends to thaw out, which actually gives the plants and flowers that bloom at the base of these trees a scientifically uh, appreciable head start on growing season. So the warmth from the sun helping these little flowers bloom in the most frigid of times, it's just a, just a nice little lovely fact for you because, you know, you gotta stay positive. Welcome to the latest edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all your comments, corrections, and questions and bite into them like a radioactive spider biting into a bespectacled amateur photographer. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint! Oh, 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 oh. Yeah! Here we go. But getting right into it, on the last episode of Because Science, we were tackling a question that all you Raimi heads have been at. Raimi head. Raimi babies? Raimi babies. All you Raimi babies have been asking have been asking me for years. Can Spider-Man really stop a train with his silk like in the very famous and very memeable Spider-Man 2? I said that yes, it is theoretically possible to do so with spider silk. However, to make it happen exactly as it happens in the movie, some things would have to change. Peter Parker would either have to use wider and thicker strands of spider silk or the spider silk would have to be stronger than anything known to humans. But what did you have to say? The nonchalant shallot says, yes, but you have to remember that in the first movie, the spiders were genetically enhanced. It's not far-fetched to think that with great genetics comes great webbing. Spider-Man still could be a lot stronger to make this scene happen. I mean, I did say this in the episode and I totally agree. spider silk could theoretically be a lot stronger and Spider-Man silk could be a lot stronger than normal spider silk after he was bitten by this radioactive spider. That's fine and I agree with you, but I just want to touch a little bit on the evolutionary point here. That if you just had better genetics, you could have better webbing and that would always be better. I want to just address that for a second because it's very important to understand about biology and the unifying theory of biology, which is evolution. It's very important to understand that evolution doesn't really have a will. It doesn't really care what's best. It only goes with what actually works. So with something like spider silk, evolution isn't trying to get to, for all spiders, the toughness value of Darwin's bark spider, for example. It's not trying to make the best possible silk. If the genetics that the spiders happen to have in their population just tend to let them pass on their genetics more often, be more successful, it just works. It doesn't have to be the perfect version of spider silk. That's what you often hear people confuse evolution with uh, human evolution, that we're trying to get to human brains, right? If animals were as intelligent as us, they would be more more evolved than they are. That's not quite true. A slug is as evolved as you are. It's just a different track of evolution. It works. As long as it's working, it is evolved. For example, humans could be evolutionarily designed a lot better than we are now. There are a number of points in our body where if you took a look at it and be like, hmm, that's not even a way an engineer would do it. So uh, evolution isn't really trying to get at the perfect version of something like the perfect spider silk, just what works. So if a spider bit Peter Parker, would it automatically make amazing spider silk? Eh. Sure, maybe, but it also doesn't have to do that. Herod Ziastank and others point out this, that it's not just the spider silk that might potentially be the sticking point here. <laughs> it's also what the spider silk is connecting to. In the film, you see spider silk strands going out and connecting to the sides of buildings. They point out that this would also be a problem because the spider silk, even if it was infinitely strong, it would fail at the wall because it would pull the wall out. And I totally agree, we ignored the strength of what the spider silk was supposed to connect to in our analysis because we just wanted to see if spider silk could theoretically do it, all other things being indestructible or equal or what have you. In the film, I do appreciate though that when Spider-Man does try to first stop the train and he doesn't have enough spider silk strands, it does rip an entire wall out of an apartment complex showing just how much energy 
energy the train has in movie lingo uh, visually, and I do appreciate that Sam Raimi did that. <laughs> I guess he really can do no wrong, except for the third one. Eogen Quadra says, as Uncle Ben says, with great work done over time, taken comes great responsibility. Because <laughs> work is energy, and energy per unit time is power. So it's with great Lo De Lea says, the problem with the train scene for me is that Spider-Man serves no purpose in front of the train. He should have stayed on top shooting more webs. Great episode, by the way. Woo -hoo, thank you. Uh, what would I do if I was Spider-Man and I wanted to give this train the best chance of stopping? I think you're on the right track. In that, I, don't, I wouldn't put myself in front of the train and try to stop it with my legs first or just two strands. I think that's kind of dumb. What I would do is actually what happens in the fantastic new Spider-Man game on PS4, where there is a helicopter falling to the ground in the middle of the city, and what he does is progressively shoot webs as it's falling to decelerate it in kind of sections, and then it comes to a stop and hangs there like that. I would do the same thing. I would not shoot all of my web lines at once and then hold on to them. I would shoot, attach, shoot, attach as the train was moving forward so it could slowly decelerate and then you wouldn't have to hold all of the web lines in your hand at once either. I'm just saying Peter Parker got it wrong in a fictional thing. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Gwyneth Wynn, who says, with the high thickness equation, thick with two Cs, one question that hasn't been brought up is the volume of the material. I think it's somewhere around 30 cubic meters. <laughs> Even if it's somehow compressed, that's still a lot of web to either be storing somewhere inside of Peter Parker or making it somehow. Okay, so let me just, First of all, correct you. Uh, if you use the number, <laughs> if you use the numbers that we use in the episode, I think you got a decimal point wrong. It's not 30 cubic meters. That would fill up the entire screen you're watching this on with me in it. It'd be ridiculous. It's more like 0.3 cubic meters, so a third of a cubic meter. But that is still an insane amount of webbing. So if you think about eight web lines, each that have eight uh, pencil thick spider webs in them, uh, being shot from each hand of Spider-Man, that would fill up. Spider silk, spider silk, spider silk, spider silk. It would fill up twice as many as these. This is only half of what Peter Parker would need. So just, so just to, so you are absolutely right with the volume problem. This amount of stuff, twice this amount of stuff, can't exactly fit in a Peter Parker body, even when it's all cool with abs and stuff that he just saw in the mirror because he doesn't need glasses anymore. Where does all the silk go? I don't want to think about it. It's his butt. This amount of silk can't fit in your body without some hand wavy mechanism happening. Even spiders need material to synthesize the spider silk, and that material comes from the stuff inside of their bodies already ready, so it's too much. So for pointing out a correction that I did not even think about in our calculations because I was just going pure mathematics, you were indeed, Gwyneth, a super nerd. Get it in here. Nice. But of course, I'm not always right. Sometimes I'm very careless with props that I eventually have to pay for. So what did I get wrong last week? Our first correction comes from Colin Stone, who gets at our super nerd comment just a little bit, saying, there's no way Spider-Man's body could produce that much silk without losing a ton of mass, as we saw, over a short period of time. Dude would need to be snacking constantly. And I think we can calculate something like this. Let's, let's take a high protein food like an egg. How many eggs would Spider-Man have to eat just to produce all that silk we just saw in that short amount of time to supply his body with the necessary materials to create all that spider silk organically? Well, let me just, let me, let me just do it. TI-84, baby! Doing the math here. Okay, so we take about a third of a cubic meter of spider silk. It has a density a little bit higher than water, 1.3 grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, so then we have a mass of spider silk. Uh, let's assume that all of that is protein, but it's not really, so we're gonna get a different factor here. And we plug in those numbers, 0.3, cubic meters and then divide by the amount of protein in the average egg, we get, okay, so Spider-Man, in Spider-Man 2, to produce the volume of silk that we said he would have to, would have to eat, if he was constantly snacking, always be snacking, as Colin suggests, he would have to eat literally hundreds of eggs in that short amount of time. It would be a, a few eggs per second. It'd be like, 
Spider-Man, save us! Yeah, yeah, I got it! <laughs> wow. I can see why they didn't do that. But yes, you're exactly right. Spider-Man would need to be supplying his body with something in order to produce all of that silk. I think that's why the uh, non-organic, the synthetic web shooters kind of get around that problem, right? Spider-Man has to go through cartridges and replace them. It's because it's actually losing material as it's shooting out. So Spider-Man would need to be snacking. Speaking of, in the void, what kind of snacks are there? Anything good? You know, I'm a builder bar man. I like a cliff bar. I don't like the consistency of Cliff Bars. Hard to eat, especially when it gets cold. Love a Builder Bar, 20 grams of protein per bar. A little expensive, but you know what? If you need to get that protein, Spidey boy, get a Builder Bar. God So Loved has a correction. Frequent commenter says, Kyle, you said the train stops using just spider silk, but don't forget that he may have decelerated the train with his own feet against the several beams of wood, as we see in the first part of that scene. Plus, the train smashes through the barrier at the end of the track. Yes, God So Loved, uh, I agree. We did, just for the ease of calculation here, because we wanted to see if it was theoretically possible, we ignored a lot of sources of energy loss, and we should be clear about that. In a real-world situation, the train would be losing its energy, its energy of motion, its kinetic energy to other places, not just the silk itself. There's air resistance, there's friction between the train and the tracks, there is that initial deceleration that Spider-Man is attempting with his legs, it would slow it down some percentage, but what we were assuming was that the train itself was an idealized case. If it just had this energy, what would it take to stop it? This is then the border case. This is how much spider silk you need at the very most. Anything else, if you start including other losses of energy, then you can ramp the amount of silk down. Why I didn't do that is because calculating those other energy losses would be extremely difficult. Frictional losses for train tracks, air resistance with a, a train with a man and a web at the front of it, with some windows broken, some not. It would be very complicated. So we were just trying to get at the educational value of this theoretical question. Michael John Kelly says, just so you know, the weight you used was likely for the MTA's R160 line of subway cars. However, Spider-Man 2 actually reached out to Chicago and dressed up a six-car train on their elevated tracks. This means they were using uh, cars that had an average of 22,000 kilograms, much less than the 38,000 kilograms that you used. Unfortunately, still too little to make a difference to the conclusion. Well, you're right. If Spider-Man 2 really did use a different kind of train car, then the mass would be lower or could be lower, which would lower the amount of kinetic energy that Spider-Man Silk would have to stop. Unfortunately, as you allude to, this doesn't change our conclusion very much. Changing the mass of the cars a little bit or how many people are on the train a little bit to change the mass doesn't get at the main driver of what makes the kinetic energy for this train so high. The fact that it is going 80 miles per hour and the fact that 80 miles per hour is squared in the kinetic energy equation means that changing the mass a little bit doesn't change the total kinetic energy value all that much because you are squaring 80 miles per hour. So if you really wanted to lower the kinetic energy, you would want to slow that train way down. In fact, in the first iteration of this video, I didn't see or I didn't remember the part of the movie where Dr. Octavius pushes it to 80 miles an hour. If you have it just at the top speed of one of these train cars, like 55 miles an hour, all of our math almost works out perfectly, such that Spider-Man in that scene could stop the train. And I was very surprised by that, but the fact that it's going 80 miles per hour totally changes everything, to your point. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this video, I am giving to Ruben Rodriguez the second, who says, I think the main problem with the video aren't the web assumptions, it's the speed and weight assumptions. Even though the train is supposed to be going 80 miles per hour, the max possible speed without derailing a New York City subway car is 55 miles per hour. Also, because of the amount of light on the buildings in the scenes during the fight and during the train stop, and accounting the time of the year, I would place this incident happening in mid-May, so the amount of sunlight suggests it's close to 7.30 p.m. According to the MTA statistics, the amount of people going southbound in Manhattan at the time is about 35%, 333 people in six subway cars. And if it was westbound towards the Hudson, that number decreases to only 13%, 105 people in the six subway cars. This would affect the additional weight, making it easier to stop the train with normal uh, condition spider web. Please let me know what happens with the math then. Thanks for reading. You rock. Oh, I do. And roll. A lot of people don't know that. I rock and I also roll. Okay, Ruben. 
I did the math per your suggestion. If you decrease how many people are in the train cars in the video, in our assumptions, by 90%, only 10% of them remaining, it still is not enough to make the number of web lines and their thickness, apparent thickness, work out in Spider-Man 2. If using the strongest spider silk that we know of from the Darwin's Bark Spider, if that is four times less silk than we need, then if you decrease all of the people in the cars as per your correction, then it still is twice as little as we need. So we're still missing quite a bit of spider silk to stop the train like we see in Spider-Man. Again, I think this is because of the high velocity of the train, which you point out it can't do, but it does anyway in the film, so we have to do it. Imagine the corrections if we didn't do it then. So, <gasps> what I really like about your comment is that you are trying to use the sunlight to determine the time of year, to determine what percentage of people would be on the trains by MTA statistics? I love that. And so you are now Ruben Rodriguez, the first super nerd of your name. Ha -ha! And now to tell you what's coming up next on the Because Science channel. Have you gotten it from my brilliant hint from earlier? Well, the next episode of Because Science is, would throwing Bowser rip Mario's arms off? That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we are trying to figure out if the signature boss fight move from the absolutely classic game, Super Mario 64, if that move, throwing Bowser around in a circle and then releasing him into a bomb, would that rip Mario's arms off? If we try to get an accurate mass and size for Bowser and speed of that throw, what would happen to those blocky meat cubes Nintendo called Mario's arms? <laughs> I think we figure it out, but who would knows? So go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet. It's all about Spider-Man stopping a train. And leave me all your best comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and the tweeters. Oh! Hey, and don't forget, you can see your nose right now. Ha <laughs> ha